And thanks to the World Affairs Council of Sonoma County for inviting me back. I believe this is my third uh, opportunity to speak uh, with you. The, the topic today will be China's grand strategy. That should be in quotes and implied, does China have a grand strategy? The reason I have chosen that topic and phrased it that way is that for about two years now, there's been a marked change in the narrative on China, uh, what China is doing, and even more marked change on American policy toward China. That the simple version of this new narrative is that China has a comprehensive, diabolical, and duplicitous strategy that covers everything it does domestically and internationally, and that the goals of that strategy are inimical to American interests. That's the China side of the narrative. The US side of the narrative is that eight administrations from Nixon through Obama uh, naively, foolishly, and dangerously failed to recognize the character of China's strategy. Uh, most versions of that uh, new narrative posit that China, because it has a strategy, will win in global competition with the United States unless immediate and drastic action is taken by the US to get a countering strategy of our own. In the 30 minutes or so that I will speak with you, I hope to convince you that both aspects of this new narrative are wrong. Uh, I'm gonna focus on the Chinese side. We can talk about the US uh, side uh, and response in the question and answer period. But let me get to the question first of does China have a grand strategy that uh, from which are derived its domestic policies, its foreign policies, its security policies, uh, and shape not just policy decisions, but the actions of Chinese companies, universities, and even in the most extreme version of this interpretation, individual Chinese uh, who happen to be inside or outside of their own country. Uh, before beginning formally, I'd like to note though that this strategy or this characterization of both the Chinese and the American uh, response to the strategy that prevailed for about two years is now being seriously challenged by uh, very, very capable China specialists on many dimensions, um, including that China is not destined to be an unstoppable juggernaut. It's got enormous domestic uh, challenges and its ambitious overextended foreign policies have not been very successful. That one of the first of the challenges to this view was written by myself and a Stanford colleague, Gene Oy, uh, but many, many others have now taken up uh, that point of view. But there is always a lag time uh, between academic ideas uh, and opinion makers and uh, congressional attitudes and the like. So China as the unstoppable diabolical bogeyman is still very much a part of the American political scene. But so I wanna focus on grand strategy, beginning with what do we mean by a grand strategy? And in, in my study of international relations, um, there are actually not very many of them. That the American strategy during the Cold War, which was labeled containment, uh, to contain the Soviet Union, prevent it from expanding, that really did shape our security policies, education policies. We built our infrastructure under the National Defense Act um, in response, and it really did shape 
many, many dimensions of US policy. That's the last time we had anything like a grand strategy. And other countries don't have them very much uh, as well. Most of the time when people talk about grand strategy, it's an artificial or analytic construct that is uh, put together by looking at actions. And it's an attempt to explain what countries have done, what they're doing now, and what they will or might do in the future. So it's a framework rather than a blueprint. It's a way of explaining. And I raise the narrative that's been there because it links all kinds of mostly disparate, mostly discrete activities and puts them into the framework. And I'll illustrate that in a moment. But China, though it may lack a comprehensive strategy, does, like other countries, have a relatively small number of high priority goals. Those goals are to deter aggression, to defend China's territorial territory and sovereignty, to gain wealth and power, to improve the lot of its people. In other words, goals that are not that different from any other country. Uh, they're different in China because of China's size of China's history. But these goals both shape and constrain what it can do uh, on the international scene. And giving away the bottom line uh, up front, the challenges that China faces and the significance of the priorities that I just listed really give China no viable alternative except to continue to work with and within the rules-based order that has made it possible for the very, very rapid economic growth and increases in living standards and increase in engagement and influence around the world. To the extent that they disengage from that US-led rules-based order, China will have more difficulty or find it impossible meeting its domestic challenges. That will make it impossible for the Communist Party to stay in power, and they understand that. I'll illustrate and I hope expand on all of these points in a moment. But let me begin with the narrative on the grand strategy, not because I want to set it up as a straw man, but because it identifies important elements of China's actions uh, that we need to bear in mind. One is a proclamation of having an overarching strategy. It's important to remember China is a Communist Party led country. The rationale for communism, the rationale for communist single party leadership, going back to Marx and elaborated by Lenin, is that the party has a scientific method, a scientific plan to obtain wealth and power uh, and improve the lot of the people. There's a lot of hooey in that. There's a lot of rhetoric, rhetoric in that. But part of the legitimating process for the party state system in China is that it has a plan and all of the pieces of it are interconnected. That's quite different from the question of whether they really are, but for political purposes, they're enunciated that way. In some ways, one can think about this as a, uh, a party platform during our electoral campaigns or a State of the Union address, which is a kind of a comprehensive wish list of things that an administration hopes to achieve. A lot of what China has articulated that's identified as its goals, its ambitions are of the same category, but ratcheted up because it's rationalization for the existence of the political system that it has. The characterization that it wants to become rich and powerful 
is extended to say that the reason for that is they want to displace the United States atop the international system and want to dismantle the international system that developed largely under US leadership since World War II. That is not a part of the proclaimed or even realistic objectives of China in my view. But what are some of the things that are linked domestically and internationally to this strategy, which I'll stop calling a strategy and refer to as the set of national policies, these uh, highest order objectives. One is that the legitimacy of the regime depends on performance, which means largely economic performance that delivering on uh, better jobs, better health care, elder care, better education, protecting the nation, the, the nation from foreign uh, interference and, and aggression. Making China wealthier and more powerful is a goal that was articulated in the 19th century when China began to encounter Western imperialism, when the Qing dynasty was in decline. A weak China was a poor China, a vulnerable China. And it became very much in a succession of governments, uh, including the nationalist government uh, before the communists, uh, that to make China strong and safe, beginning with strengthening the economy. And China's policies since the late 1970s, policies sloganized as reform and opening to the outside, have very much had as the goal rapid and sustained economic growth. And it has achieved that. More than three decades of double digit growth. It's called miracle growth. Uh, it's impressive because of China's size. It's impressive because of how long it lasted. But in comparative terms, it's much less impressive. Uh, for example, it lasted, the miracle growth period lasted only slightly longer for China than it did for the other Asian tigers, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, for example. Uh, they grew at comparable rates it didn't last as long because they started from a higher base than China had. Also worth noting is that China's miracle growth stopped about a decade ago, uh, dropped below uh, 10%. It's now uh, declared to be 6%, but it's certainly less than that. And every prediction inside and outside of China is it goes very quickly to uh, three or 4%, uh, simply because of the size of the economy. But China's miracle growth stopped, unlike the other Asian tigers, before it had become a wealthy country, before it made it into the World Bank's highly developed status. And that's not simply a bragging point, uh, because countries that have, right now the number is something in excess of $10,000 per capita per year national income. China is not there, but that's the current World Bank cutoff. It's not just the money, it's the capacity to manage numerous large and interconnected problems, the amount of expertise, the bureaucratic capabilities, and the like. And China's not there. China has plateaued before it got the capabilities to move on. It is now in what economists call the middle income level and is likely subject to something called the middle income trap. A lot of countries make it to middle income status. Most don't make it out. The 50 countries that had that status 50 years ago are almost all still in the middle income category. A nun has escaped from the middle income that had more than 30 million people. China has 1.4 billion. 
maybe that'll make it easier than Mexico, for example, which wallows in that middle income category, but maybe not. But the strategy of improving the economy by tapping foreign technology, access to foreign markets, obtaining training um, to strengthen the economy through foreign direct investment, through joint ventures. China has done that very, very effectively. That it is most years the largest or one of the largest recipients of foreign domestic, domestic foreign direct investment. And a great many American firms have investments in China. A lot of it is assembly uh, in manufacturing, but they have, they have strengthened the economy by the decisions made in the late 70s to pursue an export-led growth model of development, like Taiwan, like South Korea. Using education exchanges, again, for training. Uh, China basically shut down its education for a decade, from the mid 60s to the mid 70s, completely shut it down. Uh, so even if it had been well functioning before 1966, it dug itself into a very deep hole and it's still digging its way out of that hole. And part of the strategy had been to send best and brightest abroad. There are give or take 380,000 Chinese students in the United States today. And the number that have been here in total is well over a million. Uh, we've been beneficiaries of brain drain. A lot have not returned, uh, but many have from the US and from other nations. Using economic power and tools to gain international influence. What is cited very often is the Belt and Road Initiative. This is a, some people put a price tag on it of $6 trillion to build infrastructure um, in the developing world. Uh, this has, is the legacy undertaking of uh, President Xi Jinping. It's his proposal. It is much less than meets the eye, even though I think 139 countries, something like that, have signed Belt and Road Initiative agreements to do something. But it started out as a jobs program. Uh, this is a way to use excess capacity in the construction sector, cement, steel, construction equipment, and millions of construction workers who had built everything that could be built in China. Uh, started building in the 70s. By a decade ago, China was pretty well built out. They don't need any more airports and ports and highways uh, for, and won't for a long time, uh, but to export that capacity to other countries. Using this as leverage uh, in, in, the, in the way the narrative is construed, much of it looks like what we once called dollar diplomacy. When we did it, mostly in Latin America, early in the last century, it didn't work, it didn't work for us. Uh, the Japanese used yen diplomacy in the 80s and 90s. Same idea, it didn't work. It didn't, it didn't gain. And it's not working for China. That since 139 countries have signed on, polling, reputable polling, indicates in every single one of these countries, opinion of China has gone down in the years since these agreements were concluded because the modalities of it aren't very appealing. Military power, nuclear forces to deter the United States and other nuclear powers, uh, Russia, India uh, at the top of that list along with us. Uh, but also conventional military power and activity in the South China Sea. Much has been written about the uh, construction of man-made islands and building uh, aircraft landing strips and anti-aircraft uh, missile batteries on them and so forth. I just note for those familiar with Stanford, 
that the combined area of all of the man-made islands, all of China's man-made islands, is one third the size of the Stanford campus. And we're a big campus, but it's still not very impressive. Using soft power to undermine and deceive uh, populations around the world. One of the vehicles here is Confucius Institutes, which are most of them are Chinese language instruction capabilities. Yeah, they have more of them in high schools than in colleges, more of them in other countries than in the United States. They've tried some places to interfere with academic freedom, dictating who can or cannot speak on campus. But virtually every institution where they're located has said, no, that's not the way we operate. So they're out there, they're part of an activity, but they're not very effective. And then most of the depictions of this strategy, which has many, many more elements of it than I could, that are depicted as destined to succeed. And a lot of it is predicated on two mistaken ideas. One is that China will continue to grow at the rates that it did until 2009. It's kind of the lag in thinking here. Now, China has not grown at double digit rates for a decade. So projections of continued growth uh, into the future at that rate are completely unrealistic. They also leave out of the equation the magnitude of challenges that China faces. Some of them are challenges of being a big country. Some of them are challenges of demographic change. Some of them are challenges because growth has slowed. And let me point to just a few before moving on. Demographic change. China has the world's largest population of elderly, people over 60 years old. By the end of this decade, the number of elderly in China will exceed the total population of the United States. The healthcare system is not set up to take care of all of that coronary disease, diabetes, cancer, Alzheimer's, the diseases of the elderly, like me, uh, are very complex and very expensive. China's healthcare system is not set up for that. Responsibility for paying for healthcare and taking care of elderly generally is still with the family. For two decades, but for two decades, beginning in 1979, China had a one child per couple policy. It means there's two generations of single children. Leaving aside the spoiled brat character uh, of, of that equation, what that means is that every young married couple has to contemplate a future in which they must provide support for four parents and eight grandparents. And if somebody has to stay home to take care of grandma, you can't have two working people in the household. That policy in conjunction with the process of modernization as it has played out everywhere has depressed fertility. So the limit on children has been lift, eliminated. But Chinese are not having more children because they're expensive, cost a lot of money to send them to school. Uh, that the dependency ratio in China during the miracle growth was about 16 to one, 16 workers per every retiree. It's now about four to one and it's approaching two to one. Uh, that doesn't leave a lot of money for other things. One of those other things is education. To really move into the high tech, uh, AI driven robotic, the kind of world that uh, China aspires to, you need a lot of highly educated people. Half of the youth in China 
do not graduate, do not go to high school, not only do not graduate, but most stop at middle school. And in the rural area, which is still half of the young people in the country, schools are expensive. It's free in the cities, it's free through middle school in the countryside. The high school in China's rural areas is the most expensive in the world compared to income, compared to income. Improving education can take a lot of money. Improving healthcare can take a lot of money. Providing elder care is gonna take a lot of money. Maintaining the infrastructure that has been built. High-speed rail is phenomenal. But of all the high-speed rails in China, exactly three make money. All the rest lose money, can't even pay for maintenance on them. They've built a big military. Now they discover the expensive part is paying for it, deploying it, training uh, for it. So the competition for a shrinking amount of resources is going to be intense. Awareness of the magnitude of the challenges, an awareness that China has run through the goodwill of the international system. That for about 30 years, the United States, Europe, Japan, Korea, most of the world was quite enthusiastic about assisting China's modernization. And there were no competitors in there until the collapse of the Soviet Union and pretty much the whole rest of the developing world decided they wanted to do what China did, an export-led growth model. So now China's got competitors that have, excuse me, lower labor rates around the world. India, number one, because also got a large population. Let me shift from that, from awareness to the actual strategy and what China has done and is continuing to do. The policies that were developed in the post Mao period, Mao died in 1976. He presided over 30 years, characterized by a lot of experimentation, rapid shifts in policy, and almost all of them failed. One of the ones that, excuse me, that didn't was the nuclear weapons program. They managed to build, build a bomb in there, but most of them failed. Uh, I won't elaborate on why. The point I want to make is that after his death, Deng Xiaoping and other top leaders decided they needed to stop experimenting. They needed to follow a path to modernization that had pr proven to work. And that was the Asian tiger model. That was export-led growth model. It was a model that was critically dependent on the United States. Access to US markets, US capital, US technology, US training. And as importantly, because of the shared values within the US alliance structure, the European, <clears throat> Europeans and Japanese, who also had a key role to play in China's modernization, they weren't going to move unless the U.S. said it was okay. And the U.S. decided it was not only okay, we'd support it and we'd help it uh, because of expectations of what that would do in terms of transforming China and China's behavior and constraining its options. I'll leave that for question and answer. The need, the desire to restore legitimacy to the party, the political system, in order to maintain stability. Stability seen as a critical in order to have sustained economic growth. That the earlier policies going back to the Qing dynasty had failed in part because of domestic instability, unhappy people taking to the streets foreigners that wouldn't invest because it was too unstable. So maintaining order, maintaining security. A lot of Mao's policies were predicated on his belief that war with the imperialists, which mostly meant us and then later included the Soviet Union, war was inevitable. 
and it was imminent. Therefore, priorities were juggled to emphasize the military building in the interior and not on the coast. There were a lot of things that fell from that. In 1977, 78, Deng Xiaoping redefined the security situation. He said Mao was right, war with the imperialists is inevitable, but it's not imminent. It can be deferred for two decades. That's a rolling two decades. It's still deferrable by two decades through smart diplomacy, through engagement economically, through participation in economic and educational exchanges, uh, that uh, doing things that were given a different spin in my summary of, uh, of a narrative, need to have rapid development to get the country back on its feet. 1979, China was basically in the same position it had been in 1949 in terms of income levels and industrialization, but now it had nuclear weapons in there. So stabilizing it and growing it uh, was important. The policy became one essentially of do everything necessary to grow the economy, to grow it by modernizing all facets of the economy. And if that meant modernizing the society, modernizing this political system, then they do it, but not by going all in. It's a very conservative culture, cautious culture. So it's gonna be one step at a time. The image that Chinese use, it's a, it's a traditional one, but it's now again associated with Deng Xiaoping, was crossing the river by feeling for the stones one step at a time. And what that meant was preserve as much as possible of the existing system, the Chinese essence, the socialist system as they define it, the communist party led political system, legal system. All of these things were to be changed as little as possible and to make changes small changes only when absolutely necessary to keep the, the bicycle of economic growth moving forward. Don't let it tip over. So do as little as possible, as late as possible, was the way in which China proceeded. And to its credit, up until about a decade ago, when it got to the crunch points of make a next an increasingly more difficult change in the system, economic system, societal, social system, legal system, political system, it did it. About a decade ago, they got cold feet. About a decade ago, further changes began to really get at critical dimensions of the Chinese system. For example, an independent judiciary, a true rule of law system in China. In China, the party is above the constitution. The party is above the courts, that it's not subject to it. To make the party's role subject to an independent judiciary knocks out one of the critical pillars of the system. By a decade ago, changes in the nature of the economic system, more scope for private enterprise, less uh, of a role for the state-owned enterprises, would have gotten at another pillar of party control, the planned aspects of it, the centralized control, and the interest of an elite that developed in the 1980s that when the reform started in China in the late 70s, there was no opposition. Mao's excesses had wiped out the old elite, had wiped out old economic interests uh, of all kinds. Now there is an entrenched elite, which has done very well because of reform policies. It's one of the great ironies that China has the wealthiest legislature in the world. 
there are more billionaires and multimillionaires in the Chinese National People's Congress than in any parliament in the world. It's a rubber stamp and has no power. But that's where the rich are. But I, I use that to illustrate that further changes necessary to sustain growth, meet the challenges, bump right up against the interest of exactly the people that would have to make those changes. And they think this blast reform was good stuff. We don't need to go any further. And that's producing real friction with much of society, including the private sector. China has what is called the humiliation narrative or victim narrative. It speaks of the century of humiliation from the Opium War of 1840 up until 1949, but they talk about this era continues. And it has made China standing, a China's government standing up for sovereignty, territorial integrity, made the necessity to demonstrate economic performance and progress critical. So China, this plan, this approach of do everything necessary to sustain growth, to meet the needs of the people is real. It's real pressure. They don't have elections, but that's real societal pressure that you don't want to even contemplate having a billion and a half unhappy citizens, even if it's only a billion. I mean, that's a big problem uh, if you're a, a political leader. So figuring out how to meet the needs, the kinds of needs I illustrated with elder care and health care, education expenses, are compounded by the demography. Give or take 70% of the population of China has no experience other than sustained rapid growth and rapid improvement in living standards. Now that's plateaued. Now opportunities are shrinking. Two thirds of the graduates of China's universities now cannot find jobs worthy or requiring the level of education that they have, their families have paid for here. That, that this youthful population has real needs, have real demands and high expectations. And because of the, the demographic, there's, there's no extended family in China. For 2000 years, the biggest safety valve in a system was the extended family that would take care of financial challenges, that the elders would talk down the impetuous youth who wanted too much, who wanted everything uh, right away. There's no uncles, there's no aunts, there's no siblings uh, in this system anymore to exercise that kind of governing factor. What happened to this strategy? I said that it's adopted in the late 70s. It's still in effect, reform and opening, but reform has stalled and in are some areas going backward. Uh, openness to foreign ideas, press access, uh, uh, private sector, scope for private sector activity. Uh, it's going backwards because the leadership is worried about instability. And their toolbox doesn't have very many instruments in it except coercive ones. That they can't provide more uh, concrete benefits to a youthful population that says, don't tell me what you did for grandpa. What have you done for me lately? And what are you going to do for me tomorrow in, in this? And it's they're impatient, they act like young people everywhere, and there's and they're are not the system checks that were there a decade ago of elders saying, don't push for too much. We don't want to lose what we just got. But this middle income capacity here of seeing something better, wanting something better, and being unable, it's a, it's a, uh, a receding horizon for many young people. 
I'll close with saying that the desire to maintain order and stability has caused the party leadership to take a number of actions internally and externally to demonstrate how they stand up for China and so forth that are clearly counterproductive. And they understand they're counterproductive to it and they won't work. They're not working, which is why I'm quite convinced that the trajectory is headed back towards China participating in as a responsible actor in the global system that is rules-based from which we benefited and which we will continue to play a dominant role. Let me stop right there.